A woman who's been impaled on a tree after being pushed off a cliff, then chased by the men who wronged her, is probably not thinking about premium coffee while she's alone in the wilderness. Maybe, but probably not. But Jen barely eats or drinks anything during her traumatic weekend in Revenge. So I'm going to pitch the idea that we go back in time to that cave where Jen cauterized her own gaping wound with a fiery beer can. And what will we do but replace that alcohol with... Spark Mug Coffee! Okay, now that's never going to happen, but it's entirely possible that most of the events in this movie were virtually impossible and never happened either. So I'm going to continue this train of thought. All you listeners, not to mention Jen, should know that Spark Plug offers the freshest beans in Canada. These are even fairly traded, premium, Arabica beans. If you don't need a jolt of caffeine in addition to doing peyote, the way Jen clearly does though, perhaps you'd prefer decaf or half-calf. Be calm. Spark Plug has all of that. They've also got all kinds of blends and roasts, and even a rotating seasonal blend. I suggested we need to get Jen some java in that lonely cave. Well, even though this movie was filmed in Morocco, of all places, it seems to be set in the United States, so we could at least get her some of the hot brown stuff into the general area, or she's running around in only her underwear. After all, spark plug, well, in a bra. After all, spark plug ships to America, and of course, people in Canada, within a week. We Canadians will even get our orders placed on our front porch without having to pay a cent in shipping costs. And while you wouldn't want to be a member of the club of guys who treat women the way the men in this movie do, you should become a member of Spark Plug's Autopilot Coffee Club. And if you do that, you'll be eligible for perks and deals that others don't get. You'll even save money on every order. You can also customize your membership to get your stuff when it suits you. So if you're trying to kill and not be killed in the desert for a few days, you can put a pause in those orders. Priorities. Priorities, Bev. And this is not a silly-ass Coffee of the Month Club. So go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. You'll save 20% on your next order by using that H-Y-E-S promo code, which also puts a little bit of money in our coffers. Okay, now that I've thought about it, my fantasy of helping Jen with a little package from our sponsor isn't going to happen. But talking about her plight in this badass movie is about to happen. So Andrew Luther, please ignite that theme music and we'll get this podcast started. And action! Have you ever seen... Revenge. And we have. For me, this is the third time, and for Babbitt, was the second? Yes. So we hope you've taken the time to watch the flick before hearing this podcast, because we will be spoiling. So welcome to the 503rd edition of Have You Ever Seen, the weekly husband and wife jam session that discusses all sorts of motion pictures, usually classics from long ago. In this case, it's a lot more recent than that. I'm the selfish prick who uses saran wrap to contain the gaping wound that's pumping blood like a fire hose, Ryan Ellis. And here's the shoeless lady who, after a near-death experience, gets by on rage because she's had no food, no water, and has a gaping wound in her own gutty what's. My wife, Bev. That's me. Is that remotely possible that she could ever have survived any of that? Of course not, but is that remotely the point? No, but the first time I saw this movie, I think I didn't really dwell on that for the last couple times. You analyze films. You look at, is that something that could even happen? She would have broken her back on the fall. She never would have survived the fire when she lights that broken, destroyed tree on fire to free herself. And then, of course, she's got this huge wound with a stick inside of it. (laughs) But I guess maybe you could argue that, like other movies we've discussed in the past, a huge chunk of it is just a, in this case, revenge fantasy. And that fits because it's Revenge Month. So welcome to a brand new theme month. It's something we've never done before. I just said it. Revenge Month. We'll be posting five podcasts in April, and they'll all be about women going hard after someone who's wronged them. We have not talked about films with women directors that much lately, but we'll have two ladies behind the bullhorn this month. And we start with Coralie Fargeet's Revenge. So, the coming attraction's opinion question. What is the most cathartic revenge movie you've ever seen? Not necessarily the best, but the most cathartic. Well, the ending that makes me the happiest when I see the violence take place is Death Proof. When they mm. drop kick him in the face, oh, just gives me chills. Absolutely worth the price of admission. And that will come up again in two weeks. We are doing Death Proof this month. Revenge is on the list, and so is Kill Bill, another Tarantino film. Death Although, Proof. I wouldn't say the ending is cathartic to Kill Bill. It's emotional. You're right. There you go. I thought maybe you were going to say that. That's why I included my little list here, because I thought you were going to say Kill Bill. Oh, but... no. If you said, what's my favorite revenge movie, I would say Kill Bill. I know, Tarantino film. Mm-hmm. Also, in Glorious Bastards, great revenge movie with a pretty seen, incredible cathartic seen ending. Seeing Hitler get mowed down with a machine gun. It feels pretty good. Exploded. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to go with a movie that's been hated by a lot of people. But when we talk about catharsis and payback and all that, and it does actually jibe with this movie in many ways, 
I Spit on Your Grave, or Day of the Woman. There's been a remake, and I think that even has sequels, but the original in the 70s. I've only ever seen it once. It's like Irreversible, which also has a big rape scene, but that's not about revenge. There's revenge in that, but of course the movie's backwards, so that's at the beginning. But in I Spit on Your Grave, what they do to her is worse than you can even imagine. You've probably never seen it. For that reason. So as brutal as that movie gets, it's hard not to feel satisfaction when she utterly destroys those guys. I've only ever seen that movie once. I probably won't watch it again. But I can picture... Well, maybe I've seen some of the scenes on YouTube, come to think of it. I think I have. So I haven't seen the whole film again, but I've watched some of the clips on YouTube. And even that, in the two or three minute clips, man, they deserve it. But whoo, whoo, yeah. This movie actually fits this profile as well because Jen gets some payback. The girl with the star earring who kills people, was screened at a lot of festivals in the fall of 2017. Then was released in North America five years ago on May 11th, 2018. It was not a financial success, but it should have been. I remember when I first showed this movie to you on, I guess, Shudder. Mm -hmm. You loved it the first time you saw it, didn't you? Oh, hell yeah. You? Yeah. Okay, well then, the skinny, please, on Revenge, Bev. Matilda Lutz is Jen, a young, gorgeous woman enjoying a weekend away in the desert with her married lover, Richard, and his two hunting buddies, Stan and Dimmy. When Dimmy. Stan... <laughs> when Stan rapes her, Jen freaks out and threatens to tell Richard's wife about them. So, he pushes her off a cliff. That's the end, right? Wrong! Jen miraculously survives and is reborn into a total badass. She stalks and kills the men in the desert one by one, becoming stronger with each act of vengeance. They could have called the movie The Phoenix as well because of the beer can and the fact that she's reborn in fire. What's her name from X-Men? Jean Grey. The Dark Phoenix mm -hmm. is reborn after she dies. Or, in a nutshell, hunting trip turns into a hunting trip. <laughs> yeah. Or, if I'm Jen from 25 minutes in the movie until the end, she says nothing. That's right. <laughs> she grunts and she makes noises. She cries at one point, which I think is actually a little cathartic too because she's tough and all these other things, but she's still human. But she doesn't say another word. And I think I read that online and first saw the first time, maybe even for the second time with you and thought... Wow, that's true. She doesn't ever speak again, even when she's actually encountering these guys. That's a fascinating detail, too, that this she actress... speaks with violence. Well, true, but she's got such charisma and screen presence and is so pretty. More so early on, obviously, than when she's covered in blood, although she gets one hell of a hero shot when she comes out of that cave after cauterizing her wounds. Oh, yeah. Beautiful cinematography in this film. Did you see that she was cast only one week before they started shooting? No. The actress they originally cast dropped out for some reason... And so she had days to just get her act together and fly to Morocco and then spend weeks shooting this film. So she had very little time to prep, but she's incredible in this mm. movie. This is what surprises me, though. The critics liked the film, the Rotten Tomatoes, that is, and the audiences on that site did not. 93% of critics liked it. 7.6 out of 10. 135 reviews. Good sample size. 58% of audiences. What? They give it a thumbs down. Do you think maybe it got... Bombarded by trolls or Probably, something? Probably, because this is around the same time the Girlbusters thing. I don't know if the critics on Ghostbusters, the one with Wig and McCarthy, if the critics liked that, but I think that was more of a fan thing where they just torched it. I feel like that's around the time this started, where it was just this, let's ruin something. <laughs> well, this movie came out kind of in the midst of Me, Me too. too. It was written well before that, and I think Me Too was maybe happening when they shot it. But yeah, there was certainly a contingent of angry people with agendas, lots of time and agendas to spoil any piece of media that might have supported Me Too. I was actually looking up Me Too, and I guess it started really in 2006, Toronto Burke on MySpace. I'd never heard of that back then, but then I guess I wouldn't have. I didn't ever go on MySpace. Anyway. Yeah, it was like a humble, small piece of activism until it blew up in 2017. And then she took off all along with Alyssa Milano, apparently was one of the people that wanted to know about things like, have you been harassed in the workplace? Never mind, raped or assaulted, but just bothered by men, treated like you don't count, patted on the ass, objectified. And that was more like five, six years ago, apparently. So that's when this really did blow up around the time this movie was coming out in festivals and then at the box office. I think in general, there was a huge wave of sentiment supporting it because people were so outraged that Trump won the election. And that just gave so much momentum to movements like this. The Women's March in January of 2017 helped galvanize the movement. And it had real momentum for that entire year. Until it didn't. <laughs> I think it still does in a lot of ways. I think it still does. I think it did change people's attitudes. It did change the world. But the backlash has been pretty extreme. 
the biggest thing about Me Too for me personally, and I can't speak for anybody else, is that when I saw on Facebook specifically, because that was more about the things like, have you been treated like you don't count the same way? Or you paid less. Somebody's eyeballing your tits. Are they patting your ass? None of these things are cool, but they're not the extreme stuff. This isn't about the rape and everything we see in this film. The number of people I saw on Facebook that would do simply hashtag Me Too, it shocked me, just the number of people that actually said this ever happened to them. And that's what I think social awareness and woke is all about. I was awakened. Yeah, it was funny. You and I had some really interesting conversations about it because you were surprised that I could also do hashtag me too. And we talked about it. I was a little surprised how much you didn't know about, but then it opened my eyes to how much women talk to each other so much about this kind of stuff. But we just don't talk to men about it because historically we don't get taken seriously or it's not something you bring up on a first date or at the dinner table. It's not something people ever want to hear about. And I think a lot of people reacted like you did, that it did open their eyes, that it did change your perspective on everything about misogyny and the patriarchy. But I think for other people, it made them double down right. and get really aggressive about shutting women up. And they still do here in 2023 and beyond, I'm sure. Okay, so we got the DVD from the library, actually. I was going to pay for Shudder for a month and maybe watch Skinnamarink, which I think is on there, but instead I saw the... I love that, actually, the DVD at the library. It's just huge letters going down, R-E-V-E-N-G-E. -E. You can't miss it. I've seen it so many times there and thought, well, I'll go look in late March for recording in April and see if it's there. There it was. So anyway, all that big buildup, mm -hmm. your second viewing on Revenge... I guess you like, I know you like it, but yeah, yeah, I just love this movie. My favorite genre of B film is people hunting people, surviving the game. Oh, quickly, ready though, or not, first we blood. thought The Hunt, which Republicans like Trump so outraged about, was not a good movie. And it was Democrats hunting Republicans. I still enjoyed it because I yeah. love, okay, you didn't enjoy it. Was it was well made. I'm saying I love this genre of film okay. so much that even when it's bad, it just scratches an itch for me. And I can't put my finger on what it is I like so much about it. But you're right, that movie was just okay. It, it had some fun scenes in it. There was some stuff that was good about it. But what's funny to me about Republicans getting mad, none of them had watched it, because if they watched it, they know that Republicans are the heroes of that film. That's true. The hero of that film is like a gun-toting redneck. It's the Yellowstone of movies. Yes, yes. <laughs> and all the villains are these liberal, glass tower, judgmental, judgmental, totally phony, who are killing rednecks. It's ridiculous how Republicans Republican that movie is, but Republicans didn't bother watching it before they criticized it. Revenge. This movie just really scratches that itch for me. It's a great touch that Jen is not the, quote, perfect victim, but she really gets her victory without compromising herself. She changes, but it feels more like she's plumbing the depths that were already there. If she ever recovers from this trauma, I feel like she'll go right back to being sexy and girly. She'll really? find another pair of star earrings. I don't think so. You disagree. I think she's that changed. I'm going to get to the what happens next right now. Will Roberto, the helicopter pilot, do the right thing by Jen? She's the only one that lived in this whole thing. And Richard had called not long before. So he's coming. He was chummy with Richard. And you know Roberto is going to ask what happened to him. As he should, understandably. If he looks in that house, he's going to see nothing but blood everywhere and a dead man. He's not going to find out necessarily immediately. He won't, but the authorities would. Two other dead bodies somewhere in that area. Does Jen have to worry he'll try to rape her himself? Or will he tell everybody she's a murderer? Which I guess she is, but we know why. Rather than someone who defended herself and killed them all very justifiably. Of course, if he tries to rape her, she's proven she can handle herself. But even though we know she should be treated with gentleness and respect by him or anybody after what she's been through... I just fear for her future. You really think that she can't take on Roberto? No, she taking, can. Yeah. But either he's going to try something and then she kills him and then what? Because she can't fly the helicopter. Or he takes her to safety and says, she killed my friend. She's covered in blood. Go investigate. Look at all the blood everywhere. She survived and they didn't. And I don't know if you could prove that she was raped. We know what happened to her. We know she should be treated properly. But I really reject the notion that she's going to be a bubbly party girl again. That's why I had the caveat, if she ever recovers from the trauma, you could argue that she kind of belongs in prison. Now, when she kills Dimmy, she's truly defending her life. When she kills Stan... She's going after she, them. But Richard is just chilling. He's in the shower. And she ambushes him. She could have just chilled and waited for him to go and found a way to get home. She could have gotten away at that point. But she truly was out for revenge. And Richard is a wealthy man. He's a family man. With connections, he might try to find her and kill her. 
Well, absolutely. In the real world. Yeah. She kind of belongs in prison, but I picture her being the kind of prisoner who would make shift makeup out of whatever she can get her hands on. One of the best things about this movie is that she starts off as this, for lack of a better word, but I think it works. It's vacuous like she, nothing? She's vacuous and slutty. She's really sexy. Mm. She wears these little outfits. She has a Lolita thing going on with the lollipop and yeah, her it's... little itty-bitty outfits. And everything is so pink and girly. And she's got her blonde hair and her makeup. And as she's going through the process of changing, those are things that are stripped from her. Her blue shirt goes away, her bright blue shirt, and then... Her blonde her, hair is dirty, so it her, almost looks but brown. Her blonde hair straight up changes color. It's not even that it's dirty. She's a brunette. They made a choice to just change the color of her hair, representing the fact that she truly has gone through a change. It's almost supernatural. She has, like, superpowers. She can run faster than Stan's car. With no shoes. With no shoes on. She doesn't need to eat. She doesn't need to drink. She's just this powerhouse. House That's of, why I don't think this, avenging this is real. Angel, right? This is a vertigo thing we've said. Or a taxi driver, in this case, a lot more of it. But it's, it's a fantasy. It's just elevated. Yeah, it's definitely a fantasy. It's kind of elevated reality. Fargi has said that she really wanted to create something that was phantasmagoric. What a great word. Why make something boring that's based in reality when you can make something fantastic that makes you want to stand up and cheer? Because it does. But even little touches, oh, like when her ear gets shot off Mm. and she loses one of the earrings and her nails are getting chipped. There's no part of her that seems to be shamed for the way she was before. The whole rape-revenge genre, which is a huge genre that was really popular in exploitation films in the 70s, I've never gotten into it. I can't really speak with authority about it because I don't want to watch women get raped. The movies really weren't made for people like me. Usually the heroes weren't women. I spit on your grave as an exception, but usually the heroes were their fathers or their husbands or boyfriends. Like Last session on the left. That's the fantasy, that a man, a strong man, comes and avenges this horrible thing that happened to a woman that he cares about. And they often, like I Spit on Your Grave, really focus a lot of attention on the crime, on the rape, something that revenge absolutely does not do. You don't even see the rape. It happens off screen. You hear it, but not even for a long time. There's far more attention paid to the lead up to the rape, the menace of Stan peeping on verbally her, verbally cornering her. Yeah, peeping on her, making her uncomfortable, exercising his power. She's trying to politely get out of it. She's trying to do and say whatever she can to just you came keep on to me. safe. Yeah. The worst part about that whole scene, though, well, the worst thing is the rape. But from a filmmaking standpoint, and this is obviously intentional by Coralie Fargie, Dimi. And I'm saying that because that's the way that the mother says an exorcist, Dimitri, not Dimitri, what's his name again? Damien. Dimi, you leave me. Anyway, so when Dimitri sees this and he stands there eating those sweets or something like that and the tight close up on him biting into the thing, obviously meant to make him look like a pig, stands the villain. But Dimitri seeing this, not doing anything about it, closing the door, that's one of those, oh man, type moments. Then he goes in the other room and because she's screaming as she should be, as she's getting raped by the window, standing up. Then he turns up the TV to drown her out. So that's a little bit heartbreaking, too. Then he goes swimming, and she can see him dive in the water. I like the way that she chose to do that, that it's not the focus on the rape, it's not the focus on Stan or on Jen. It's almost like the person that witnessed this and said nothing. What's that thing I always say about evil happens when good men do nothing? Mm. Not that Dimitri's a good man, but I don't think he's a bad person either. I don't think he's Stan was a... What are you talking about? He no, I mean, himself to be a bad person later. No, I mean... Before this happened, I don't know that Dimitri and Stan were bad people. Did we see the same movie? No, I'm saying before this all happened, I'm talking about the night before, they were just guys. Okay, okay. We don't know that they've ever done anything like this before. But Stan is pushed over the edge by his own fucking ego, basically, and rapes this beautiful woman that his friend is with. There's so many things that are wrong with what Stan's doing, too, because A, he's raping her, that's bad enough. B, she's screaming. It's not like she got into it, as a lot of guys have said over the years. And C, it's his friend's girlfriend now they know that he's married but anyway there's so many levels to that whole thing but i do love that farjeet makes it so much more deep by having dimitri not be unaware of it because he was sleeping in the pool when she woke up and had a little bit of time with stan outside but then for him to witness it the villain is stan of course but the other villain is the person that did nothing he's the good man not that he's good he's the one that saw the assault on the street the mugging or the raping on the street in our own lives and just walked away which is asking a lot of somebody who's just walking by something like that that happens. But when it's your friend and you could stop it, 
you do end up being complicit too. And who's the first one that gets killed brutally, who's also the only one that ever really does anything to her once she got away. It's he could Dimitri. have killed her. He had her dead to rights, yeah. and he definitely could have But he wants around. to waterboard her and torture her. No, no, he's a sadist, it turns out, who wants to tell her his evil plan to lure her in, to trick her into getting close to him so that he could slowly drown her. The night before, when they're drinking and partying, there are many shots of Dimi leering at her, staring at her ass. Well, Stan does too. Yeah, yeah, watching her through binoculars. And then ultimately, true, right? his crime is that he just watches. He watches Stan rape her, maybe watches from the pool. We don't know, but he's the leerer. So how does she kill him? She stabs him in both of his eyes. Right. <laughs> like, watch this, motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then he bloats like the piggy is in the water for them to find his disgusting, terrifying corpse the following day. I'm not excusing him. I'm just saying that I think that's one of the things that she's doing in this movie is the notion that he could have stopped it and he did nothing at all. But then it's not even a matter of him going out there and sitting on the couch and fretting about it. Oh, or... no. He turns out the volume of the TV so he doesn't have to hear her screaming. Mm -hmm. and, and, then and then goes out and goes for a swim. That's yeah. what I think is so fascinating is that first he's eating and watching, then he's drowning it out, and then he's swimming. Yeah, he's not ignoring it so that he stays out of it. He's not ignoring it because he doesn't want Stan to get mad, even though Stan's like, either you come and join or you get the fuck out. Sure, I'll get the fuck out. But he's not afraid of Stan. You don't mm -hmm. get that impression whatsoever. He just is truly indifferent about what happens to Jen. Right. Which I think is what she has already realized at this point in the film, was I am not safe here with these men, at least Richard, when it's just the two of them, because it was just supposed to be the two of them mm -hmm. in the place. She would have been gone before they got there. Yeah, yeah. Richard didn't even want his friends to find out that she existed. Right. Maybe because he knew Stan was this kind of guy. And fitting that he's the one, Richard's the one that's saying... Once they think she's dead, Jen who? She doesn't exist anymore. Oh, yeah, he's the true charismatic sociopath. And the one he's an that, excellent liar. And the one that raped her, Stan, is the one that seems to have remorse. It may not be enough at this point, but he wants to help her more he than He says, it's not do. too late. We can take her to the hospital. But he caused all this. He caused it, but he didn't push her off the cliff. No, that's true. I'm sure he would have found some way to weasel his way out of it, but murder was not on his mind at all. When they have to choose where to split up, where to go in different directions to get her, he's like, I'll just stay in the car because he doesn't want to kill her. He doesn't have the guts to kill her the way Demi and Richard obviously do. I mean, he's going to go hunting, so it's not like he's not capable of violence, and he is a rapist. But I guess it's much easier to rape somebody that you feel has no power than actually commit an act that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Now when push comes to shove, he is ready to kill her in the end. And speaking of poetic justice, while Dimmy gets stabbed in the eyes, he's the watcher who did nothing, Stan gets penetrated by the glass. Oh, yeah. There's this great scene. I actually found this great interview with Farjeet about this particular scene because he's chasing her. He has one bare foot because the only item of clothing he could think of to stop his bleeding was a sock. She breaks the glass of her flashlight. What, he gets shot in the shoulder to stop yeah, 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 the yeah. sock for that? She breaks her flashlight so that there's glass all over the ground. He steps on the glass and then he has to pull the shard of glass out of the bottom of his foot. I think they spent as much time and effort on the prosthetic foot mm -hmm. <laughs> that he has to pull the glass out of his performance in that moment out of this world, 1,000% convincing. Mm -hmm. It is the most distressingly realistic scene of a man pulling glass out of his foot, and the glass is in there. Got way really, in there. Way in there. He has to dig in. He has to get his fingers in there. There's so much blood. I mean, there's such an unrealistic amount of blood in this movie. They anyway. ran out of it. That's right. They ran out of fake blood. <laughs> yeah. So he's digging, and that gash in his foot, you can't tell me it's not supposed to look like a vagina because it totally looks like a vagina. And then what does he have to do? He has to painfully penetrate the vagina to take the shard of glass and out of it. And shriek and scream. Yeah, shriek and scream. He's in pain. Poetic justice, his punishment that suits the crime. He also has to be penetrated. And Farjeet said in an interview, because she edited the film herself right. as well. She talked about how hard it was as both a woman and a first-time filmmaker to rationalize her vision and to fight for her vision and to get people to trust her or fight through all the people who had opinions about this or that. And she talks about how she left the scene so long and everybody told her to cut it. Her producers were telling her to cut it. But I'm so Wait, cut glad. it out or cut it down? Cut it down. Just okay. cut it down. But I'm so glad she did it. I'm so glad we sit with his pain and his discomfort. There's something about that scene that really works for me, not just because he's a villain who deserves it and I want to see him suffer, because I do. The movie's so effective that it is a pleasure to watch him suffer with this very particular injury. 
But I don't know, there's something about the way she makes us sit in that moment and in that discomfort that is part of what I think takes this movie from an exploitation B-film to something that feels elevated. I don't have a problem with that either. He deserves to be hurt very badly. And she finally kills him. So she just killed all three guys. The looker, the rapist, and then the guy he was actually with. So when they arrive, Richard and Jen by helicopter, we see this dreamboat couple. I'd love to see Kevin Jansen's Matilda, Anna Ingrid Lutz, her full name, Matilda Lutz, but Anna Ingrid Lutz, do another movie together, but maybe in a rom-com. <laughs> because when they arrive, good God, they're hot. And then they go in the bedroom and she starts to blow him. And it's not that graphic, but you know what she's doing, of course. And she grabs his ass. We see a take of that later on. We see more of him naked in this movie than we ever see of her. Oh, big time. We see her boobs so briefly when she's changing when Stan comes in. So it's not even at all sexual. It's not in that sex scene. But we see Kevin Jansen's ass a lot in this movie. He's, of course, buck naked in the very end. And she's not. She's For an wearing... extended period of time. And right. there's that one long take that took them a whole day to shoot. So you know he was just on set for an entire day with no clothes on. Do you notice there's like a six-minute unbroken yeah. shot? as they circle the house yeah. over and over again. Mm-hmm. Of course, he's just gushing blood. No, no, blood. when he's from the shower. Oh, the, before anything the shower. happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also when they're going through the house, and there's at least a few unbroken shots in there, too. You're right, though, yes. He hears a sound, and he immediately realizes it's her. Of course, he probably should think it could be Stan. He doesn't know Stan's dead. But then again, they show that scene where he's sitting in the desert... In the shade of the little chopper he's on. Whose motorcycle is this? It's your chopper, baby. Whose chopper is this? Zed's. Zed's dead. His little motorbike thing. He's laying in the shade of that and calling for Stan. And Stan does not respond. So I guess he realizes, well, she got Stan. Or he's dead somehow. So he should be paranoid that when he hears a sound, it's her. But then because she's outside, it makes me wonder, is she just toying with him? Did she make a sound in the house that he could have heard? Because if she was just on the pool deck, I don't think he would have heard that. Especially with the shower on. So she go inside to make a sound, then go outside and then just hold that gun. And by the way, the poster shot of this movie, and there's a lot of poster shots, but the one of her with the earring, the bloody face, holding that giant gun is when she's stalking Stan. And she's, mm-hmm. of course, gone on the warpath at that point and is attacking them because who can blame her? She's in the middle of nowhere, too. That's what's so fascinating about this movie. We assume it's supposed to be set somewhere in maybe Nevada or yeah, something Fargy like that. said that she said it, you know, shot in Morocco, as you said, but... They're speaking French a lot in this movie and English. It was filmed in Morocco, but set either in Mexico or in the deep south of the States. And Matilda Lutz is Italian. So she said she intentionally wanted it to be in every place. It's a desert. A lot of places in the world resemble that landscape. And they picked Morocco because... It had the villa, number one. Mm -hmm. It had the cave, and it had the water element that they needed. So she found all of her locations there. They intentionally never said where it was. Now, the fact that there was peyote is what made me think, oh, it must be in Mexico. That's where you get peyote. It looks like the Mexican desert, so I totally assumed that was the case. But she said, no, no, they were trying to keep it really vague. But we're talking about her being in L.A. or wanting to go to L.A., too, which she she could be somewhere else, but maybe she's not that far from L.A. They say she's American. I imagined her backstory was that she was a stripper in Vegas or something, that she was a sex worker of some kind because she's just so aggressively sexy and Mm -hmm. she just owns it so much. And the clothes she owns are just not even clothes that a woman her age would normally wear out in public. Okay. They're short skirts and low cut tops, the kind of thing that would definitely get you noticed anywhere. Now maybe she just is the kind of girl that dresses that way, but I was like, I feel like she's a stripper. That said, they give us no backstory for her. The only thing we know about her is that she's not married to him, that he has a wife, she's a side piece, and that she wants to go to LA. We don't know where she lives now. We do know she's American. She's kind of a blank slate. And same with all of them. We really don't know very much about Mm -hmm. them at all. We don't learn that much about Richard. He has a family. He's rich, but we have no idea why he's rich, what kind of business he's in. Yeah, to have that villa, if that's his place and he's not just rented it, how much time did it take to build that? And how much would that cost in the process? Because it's in the middle of nowhere and it's got power. I guess maybe plumbing. And I guess there was a satellite dish for the TV, a pool in the desert. So he has got some serious money. I want to ask you this question, though, because in the first few scenes, probably true of both of them, for that matter, because Kevin Jansen's is a beautiful man, too, but this is more about Matilda Lutz. Do you think that Farjeet's camera objectifies her? And if it does, is it different and is it okay when a woman does that? So I can't put my finger on what it is about her gaze that just doesn't feel as vulgar. It is titillating. 
there are so many shots of her ass. Even after camera. she's been through the trauma. But maybe that's what it is. Before she goes through the trauma, when she's just Jen, we see her ass, we see her in these little outfits, but we clothed, linger at least. on her looks. Clothed, and, usually. But she's hot. The camera is really, look at this beautiful woman, look at her sexy ass. And even as a straight lady, I'm like, yes, yes, show me more <laughs> shots of her ass. Like you said, this beautiful couple, yes, please, show me more shots of them. Of both of them. They're so good looking. But the fact that the camera continues to show us her ass... As many close-ups of her hot peachy ass when she's in Terminator mode as she did before when she was kind of in the stripper mode. I think Farjeet's point is that there is nothing wrong or degrading or humiliating about Jen's behavior in the first half of the film. About her dressing sexy, about her showing her ass, about her having sex with who she wants to have sex with. Dancing with Stan, she didn't really do anything wrong. Yeah, she was being flirtatious. But no, she was not inviting her own rape. She was just having fun. They were doing drugs. They were getting drunk. They were partying. She's dancing. It's obvious in that scene. She's just trying to get Richard's attention because he doesn't want to dance with her. She's like, what if I dance with your friend? And Stan asked the next morning about, hey, maybe get together after this or even right now. And when she's uncomfortable and saying no... He did nothing wrong by asking, but then take a hint, dude. But he is a rapist. He likes seeing her uncomfortable. He goes on to make her more uncomfortable, and then he just takes her. I just feel like the movie itself leaves her with less clothes when she's in Terminator mode. I'll just say Terminator mode. Phoenix Mm. mode is better. Right. She's wearing less clothes in Phoenix mode, and she's so comfortable and in her own skin. There's so many movies that would be like, well, when she enters Phoenix mode, she'll realize the error of her ways. And the first thing she'll do is cover up head to toe in some kind of combat gear, and she'll never be sexy again. No. She's still hot. She still doesn't want to dress head to toe. She's in her sports bra and her undies. Yeah, she's just wearing uh, underwear. For mo- maybe half the movie at least because she leaves behind that blue top in the cave and I think it's red shorts or something like that. She's more nude in all those scenes than she is in almost everything before except when she's in her swimsuit at the pool which is a pretty short scene. Yeah. But she's never, I love this though, she's never fully naked and yet Kevin Jansen's often is. Yeah, it's kind of a reversal where it's not like it's titillating so much when we see him naked, but he's the one who is vulnerable in his nudity and who is for extended periods of time just flapping around Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then bleeding more than any human would bleed. (laughs) Right. Well, they both get the gaping wounds in the guts. Probably shouldn't survive as long as they do, although she does shoot him in the face and he's finally dead. It's also fascinating. He tries to buy her off with a job, which is another common thing. In Canada. What is that supposed to mean? (laughs) Canada's a great place to live. She could maybe come Uh, to Toronto. upwards of five months a year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's funny to think that they're in a desert where it's probably hot and certainly dry and at least warm, obviously, and yet come up here and we get a lot of hot weather too, but so much of the year, it's not. And she probably doesn't want to stay here. Even in Toronto. And if she wants to go to L.A., the last place she's going to want to go instead of L.A. is Canada. But right here at the film scene, at least there's that. And even Vancouver has a film scene. But no, you want to be in L.A. But then she threatens to tell his wife and then runs into the desert when she realizes what's really going on. This is a scene I've seen on YouTube many times. I think I saw this scene where she runs in the desert and he goes after her. And then the other two guys watch for a second. They look at each other and then they run after Mm -hmm. her, ending with him, Richard, that is, pushing her off the cliff. And she's impaled on the tree. I don't know for sure if I saw that before I ever saw the movie, but I think I did. And then I had to see the movie after that. And we paid for Shudder. It was one of the first movies I watched because I'd heard a little bit about it. But I saw it without you. I was blown away. Then I saw it with you. And you loved it probably more than I did. And I'm a big fan of this movie. Three viewings. And I still liked it about the same as I did the first time. But that scene is so vivid. And it's partly because of the fact that she should have died. And she probably did. But we'll go with the notion that she somehow didn't. And she's got such ingenuity that she burns herself free. She would have obviously... And that's the Phoenix moment, too. She would have roasted herself She would have roasted, yeah. yes. <laughs> but also when they come back later on to try to find her, well, not to find her, they think she's going to still be hanging on that tree. They obviously saw that she was impaled and should have died right then, should have had her back broken, never mind the impalement. But she's not there anymore. And that great tension, any good filmmaker, any good editor, and Farjeet obviously is both of those things, makes a moment like that work because if they see her, the jig is up. The movie's over and it's, I don't know, 35 minutes in. It's not going to be over at that point, obviously. But she manages to crawl away just enough and stand up against the rocks so they can't quite see her. And when they get down there, it's now nighttime. Yeah, I guess it takes them that long to get down. One of the great touches of the scene you're describing is that Dimmy finishes a beer, throws it over the cliff, and it lands right by her so that we get this great, acute impression of how close they are. Mm-hmm. How much danger she's in. Right. 
As for the Phoenix imagery, there's the rebirth in that scene where she uses the lighter to burn herself free from the tree. The Phoenix that's on that beer can, that becomes a tattoo. They point out online, and we talked about it too, that she never does the same to her back to cauterize the Also, that wouldn't actually close your wound. (laughs) You have to stitch that wound. Not that that would do any good because the internal injuries would have taken her out anyway, but you don't cauterize a wound like that. You're just adding a burn to a massive cut. You cauterize certain wounds, but not that situation. That's just burning the healthy skin around her wound. It's not closing it. It's so fantasy. You enjoy this film, first of all, because it is a really well-made film. Yeah. It's a great, tight script. It knows exactly what it is, and it sticks to its mission, and it sticks to its vision. And it offers something that, yeah, okay, we've seen this before, but she has a vision for this type of story that feels refreshing and certainly very fun to watch. I have lived most of my life in some kind of blanket terror of being at the mercy of bad men. And we all like to think we can trust our judgment, but it's just not that easy. And I think it was probably just truly luck that spared me from ever being the victim of sexual assault. But the threat has always been very real, just looming in the background of my entire life, starting when I was way too young to be thinking about this kind of thing. So there's this real cathartic pleasure of watching this itty bitty girly girl just turn it around and absolutely shred these assholes to ribbons <laughs> the pure pleasure of the violence is shocking i don't like action films all that much i don't like violence gore torture porn never appeals to me but kind of the point of a film like this is that you set up bad guys that are so bad that we, the audience, are given permission to really sink our teeth into the visceral enjoyment of violence in this primal way. It's rare. Any film hits that particular sweet spot for me, but this one really doesn't. And I think it's because it channels that fear that every single woman lives with. The moment where she's alone in the villa with just Demi and Stan, even before Stan starts getting creepy, and she just realizes Richard is gone, they have no reason (laughs) not to do anything they want with her. And that discomfort on her face, that moment of performance that is pretty subtle because, of course, if she lets them know she's scared of them, then she's in trouble, too. One of the scariest things in the whole film, before any of this bad stuff has happened, is when Stan smiles at her. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's my turn. Your turn for what, motherfucker? (laughs) (laughs) Does Richard plan to kill Stan after this? It feels like he's going to do that. Demi's already dead. Demi is dead. And then because he's already punched Stan in the face and he's pissed them for ever doing this... Richard, for all of his faults, was going to send her off in the helicopter and then undoubtedly see her again, maybe for a while yet, if she didn't ever try to say, I want to be with you instead of your wife. And she just went off and did her own thing in L.A. and they went their separate ways. That would have been fine for both of them, I think. He would have found somebody else and probably fucked her too, whether it was a stripper or not. But it's all about Stan raping her that sets us all in motion. Richard ends up being the ultimate villain, but he's also reacting to a lot of things. I'm not excusing him, but I do love this notion that he wants to and will thinking they're going to find her and kill her, because why wouldn't they think that? Okay, once we take care of her, I'm going to fucking kill you too. Demi's already dead, point. and she's dead. I'm walking out of here alone, and maybe no one's going to know you guys were ever here, and I'll pay off Roberto to say that Gemma's never here. I came up here alone to get some time away, and I went home. Presumably nobody knows where Jen is, because they're having an illicit affair. This is part of me too as well, is that a lot of men think women in general, but especially women like her, don't count. If she's a stripper, especially, but even if she's just a party girl or an aspiring actress, Mm. she doesn't fucking matter. So I can love her and leave her. And then when things get this extreme, I can kill her and leave her. What is it he says at the end when he's choking her? Oh, you women, you always fight back. And he's just like, women, you're all pain in my ass. Mm. We put the subtitles on because they make it when it cuts to her point of view that A, her eyes are covered in blood, even though when they cut back, she doesn't have any blood in her eyes. But okay, fine. It's a good shot. But also the audio drops down. You can barely hear him. It's this muffled effect. We wanted to hear what he was supposed to be saying. It's his purest misogyny coming out. Mm. The last moment when he has his hands around her throat and he's ready to kill her. And you know there's no part of him that feels bad about what he's doing. Not even just because she went after his friends and she went after him and she shot him. But because he never thought of her as anything but an object always and everything he said to her he was lying just as easily as we saw him lie to his wife there's a great scene shit has already hit the fan i can't remember exactly what stage of the film it's in but a lot of bad things have happened and he's like i'm just gonna call my wife and he makes the most chill phone call to his Mm -hmm. wife hey babe i miss you so much 
there's no part of him that's shaky, that's having difficulty putting on this whole persona. So we don't trust anything that comes out of his mouth. I agree with you 100% that if he thought it would be easier or safer for him to kill Stan after Dimitri's dead, if they were both okay and they just killed Jen, he'd be like, okay, well, we are united in a secret. I think he can't mutually trust them. Assured destruction. He couldn't trust them anyway, and he's also been mad at Stan this whole, well, it's a couple of days, forever causing any of this in the first place. Okay, fine. He brought her there. Yeah. So it's his I fault. I like what you but... say that everything he does that's evil is truly a reaction to protect himself. He's an evil man. He's a sociopath, but he didn't instigate any of the violence. He's just trying to preserve his own life mm. and fortune and if family. Stan, and... If Stan left her alone and then Richard comes back from preparing their, what was it, some kind of tickets or Visas something? Visas like or, I don't know. Visas, uh, that's yeah. right, yeah. Permits. And then she takes a helicopter with Roberto and goes back to wherever she's from, no problem. Yeah. And maybe this guy has all kinds of women he's doing this with, too. Oh, for sure. So the actors, there's not a whole lot of big credits in their resumes. And there should be, especially mm. Matilda Lutz. She's so good in this movie. Also, the actor who plays Stan, Vincent Colomb. Yeah. He's incredible. I really love him in this movie. I think that he brings a ton of depth to a villain. Maybe the most layers, yeah. He seems to work mostly in French TV and films, which is also true of Guillaume Boucher, Boucher who plays Dim Dimitri. But the other two, Lutz and Janssens. So she was in Rings, another one of the Ring sequels, I guess. Not spin-off, but sequels, I believe. But she's also in Michael Hazanavicius's One Cut of the Dead, which is a playoff of that... Was it Japanese or Korean? What, they made another one? It's not uh, the Korean one? I never heard of it. It's a remake of the, what's it called again? The One, one take, Shot One shot of the Dead? One Take of the Dead? One of those, yes. Great movie. The I can't zombie believe movie. We, it was on Shutter, They're right? Make, yes, I watched it with you too. Probably the same time or same week we watched Revenge all those years ago. It's a zombie movie that they're making in the story, but they actually encounter zombies. So it's a good take on that. It's a really fascinating film. I recommend if you're going to get Shutter, watch Revenge. Watch One Take or One Shot of the Dead. I think it's One Take of the Dead. Jansen's works a lot. He was in the movie last year that got nominated for an Oscar for, I think, international film, Close, which we haven't seen, but we'll see when it becomes available on streaming, hopefully for free. But I think Lutz and <laughs> Jansen should have got so much work out of this, and he does work a ton, but those credits for those two, and then the other two guys for that matter, not all that impressive, which is also true about Coralie Fargeet, her only feature film. It has been more than five years, and she's had no other films, although she does have something coming out called The Substance. It's in post right now. And there are people like Margaret Qualley, Demi Moore, and Dennis Quaid in that. So she has now made finally another film. These genre filmmakers, these women in the mid-20-teens, the woman who made The Babadook, what's her name again? Jennifer Kent. Kent. Jennifer Kent, awesome filmmaker. Yeah. Speaking and of revenge films, her second film. The Nightingale. The Nightingale, I mean, it's hard to watch. And I wouldn't exactly call it cathartic, but it is a beautiful film about revenge. Yeah. A lot of filmmakers in the last little while, men too, who've made these horror films or revenge films, but she's only made that one so far. But with I mean, another one coming A out. genre film just won Best Picture, just absolutely cleaned up at the Oscars. It's surprising that she wouldn't have the red carpet rolled out for her, considering this is the kind of film that should have been straight to streaming, straight to TV. It's totally a B film that made a huge splash and is now a cult favorite. Mm -hmm. When we talk about it being on Shudder, it's, it's been the, on the front page that, of Shudder. That and Mandy and I don't recognize the, tooth, the other The one with like the tooth monster. Those three movies are their big platform mm -hmm. films that they use to advertise the entire service. And we cover so many movies, so many popular movies, so many interesting movies. When I do research about them, sometimes you see that there's the Wikipedia page, there's some reviews from the usual suspects, but in general, it's not like fans have really latched on and want to write about it and talk about it. You look up revenge. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a ton of stuff on YouTube. There's a ton of people who are really into digging their teeth into this movie. And maybe it wasn't a success in the theaters, but it has a life of its own, and it's considered a cult favorite now, which is an incredible feat for any film that ought to have been buried. We never should have heard of it. This movie came out that same year. I bet thousands of low-budget horror films like this came out that we never saw the light of day right. that you and I never heard of, right? Fargi did direct an episode of The Sandman in recent history, so at least there's that. But it's not like she has a ton of TV stuff either. Sometimes people don't make that many movies, but they get into TV and they find some enjoyment there. They, it could be because she's French. Maybe she just doesn't want to make the move to LA. That could be, but in trying to find out to pronounce her name, I finally found that. I think she said it, but Coralie Fargeet is apparently how you say it. So I saw several videos and I was always waiting for them to say, we're now joined by Coralie Fargeet or however you pronounce the name. And they were always just in the interview. 
<laughs> and usually with Matilda Lutz, who we know is gorgeous. Carly Fargeet, her director, writer, editor, everything, is not that far behind. Oh, her no, star. she's a knockout. She's yeah, a she's beautiful really woman, too. pretty. And you mentioned she edited along with Bruno Safar and Jerome Eltabet. They also cut the film with her, apparently. She talked about how Cronenberg, Lynch, and Carpenter, John Carpenter, are big inspirations on this movie. And the music certainly fits the John Carpenter thing. I like the score mm. by Robin Kuder, who's a guy. The Throbbing Drone. He worked on Horns and Gretel and Hansel around the same time as this movie. There were 14 producers on this, which is not surprising for a small-budget film, including some women, which, of course, is very appropriate. The movie's 2391. We saw the DVD from the Toronto Public Library. Robrecht Havert was the one who shot it. He also shot a movie I'm never going to watch because I hated Bad Boys 2. Bad Boys for Life. That's the third one, right? Anyway, I don't care. And also some episodes of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Hmm. What a weird threesome of things he did there. His cinematography is incredible. Yeah. This movie looks so good, and I totally agree. I love this score. It's very stylized, and it's evocative of those John Carpenter films. It works amazing. And the body horror from Cronenberg. Yeah, and that ethereal, weird, otherworldly from sound. Lynch. I love it. And the special effects, too. The foot, <laughs> the blood. There are some pretty gory things that happen in this film, and... She takes advantage of a lot of strategies that low-budget filmmakers, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens off-screen, and you just hear it, and you're like, okay, you didn't have the budget for that. But sound but, can be as effective as sight. Exactly. When she lights the tree on fire, we hear it happen. We don't really see it happen. I'm sorry, my imagination looks better than CGI, mm -hmm. especially some of the CGI that people will just throw into films and... Uh, we can all acknowledge that it's gotten a little out of control and that the quality of CGI has dropped or we're all just used to it and it doesn't really have the same effect it does anymore and it makes everything look phony. I would rather it happen off screen and I hear it and she takes a lot of advantage of that. But where she does spend her money on the prosthetics, whether it's the scene where she's cutting the tree branch out of her torso, another extended, they do not let you look mm. away scene of a pretty gory wound. It looks very realistic. Stick, yeah. kind of like the foot where she spends her money and her time it looks incredible yep and also the sound when jen lands that crunch sound <sighs> reminds me a lot of the scene where amazing spider-man 2 i guess it was so the emma stone and andrew garfield ones where he tries to save her and his web does hit her chest or her midsection to pull her up but in the process she just basically bends in half and her back is broken and as I recall, the way that Jen falls on that stump in this, that broken tree, is very similar, except she lives and Emma Stone does not. Okay, then, that's Revenge. So not the 1991 with Costner and Madeline Stowe, Tony Scott film, and not the Madeline Stowe TV series, and not Revenge of the Nerds, not Revenge of the Sith, just Revenge. If you haven't seen it, obviously we recommend it. Your last thoughts. You really can't undersell a short, well-made, entertaining genre flick that sticks to the point and just entertains you beginning to end. It's a film with vision, it never falters, and it has elevated the genre. Such a compelling movie, especially considering how vicious and gross it often is. Lutz has great screen presence, and she's such a badass. We know she's beautiful as well. Not that Jansen's doesn't make for a formidable opponent himself. It'd be fun to see this couple do that rom-com I mentioned together. I think they'd be fun, sexy, maybe, I don't know if they're funny, but they certainly look the part. And Coralie Fargeet should be having to fend off people who are trying to get her to direct movies for them. But at least I saw today. I thought she'd made nothing else. And she hasn't yet. But it's supposed to come out the substance. I don't know when or where. But she's got some big stars in it. And we got to see it probably just because yeah. this is a talented filmmaker. In seven days, Bev will be taking the week off. But I'll still be on the job. Instead of posting a solo show this coming Friday the 7th, I'll put it up online on Monday the 10th. So you fans will still get an episode on our normal posting day. And what I'll be doing is monologuing about our second movie about Lady Vengeance in Revenge Month, the 1965 comedy western Cat Baloo. Cat Baloo. I haven't seen it in a long time, but apparently it fits the theme of a woman wanting some payback. And it's on AFI lists, and it won an Oscar for Lee Marvin, so all kinds of reasons I'm covering it. And also Jane Fonda in her prime. Good movie, I think. And since I don't do things like coming attractions trivia for the shows I do on my own, we'll skip ahead two weeks and set up that podcast instead which will be Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof. It's more women walloping the Christ out of a motherfucker who crossed them. Okay, we just covered Jackie Brown in December and we're running out of Tarantino movies, but we can't have Revenge Month and not talk about Quentin Tarantino. So the coming attractions trivia for Death Proof. The last scene in the movie where three women beat the living piss out of a guy is specifically paying homage to a 1960s action comedy. 
Which one? All right, so for the answer to that question, check out our next podcast in two weeks about death proof. You obviously already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen. And that's where you'll also find hundreds of episodes in our archive, our 500 and two, three three (laughs) episodes in our archive. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. You can also reach us by email. Have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com and why don't you check us out on YouTube. We have started posting every episode on YouTube. All the year so far. And we'll miss a few, I think, actually, but most of them are on YouTube. Yeah, and we add a little video component off the top. Where, on Mondays, yeah, usually. With, yeah, with additional... Yeah, <laughs> we're doing our best, guys. <laughs> and it often has additional special material Almost for always. you to enjoy. Almost always. <laughs> for the episodes we do together, I don't think we've missed one yet, have yes, we? Yes, we did. Oh, the Oscars? No, the best, best pictures we didn't do one, and I did it on my own for a few of them. It's there for you to enjoy, so please check it out. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. Jen, get to the chopper! (laughs) And cut. (laughs) Get to the chopper!